This week's guest is bassist, composer and instructor John Ferrara. John is an exceptional bassist known for his distinctive playing style and fusion of genres. In the episode, he shares that he was encouraged into bass playing by his musical family, but explains that years later he'd actually stopped playing to pursue other options. That was until his contributions to the band Consider the Source had changed the trajectory of his whole career. So how did you first get into playing bass? What what drew you to the instrument? I always ask people this. It's always my first question because I love to know kind of like why and how everything happened. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I, I grew up in a musical household. My dad's a guitarist mm-hmm. and that's what he does, you know, for work as well. And he always wanted both of his kids. I have a brother too and he wanted us to be able to play so he could play with us and, you know, how awesome and meaningful would that be? But yeah. I, I, I went in kicking and screaming. I, I was not interested at first. I played piano when I was four. He had me do that. And he was like sitting me so there. So difficult and piano is. So, so difficult. And not only yeah. j- just the playing of it, but um, with my tiny little fingers, but also uh, reading. I'm still, to this day, I'm a terrible reader. And I really, really hated that part of it. And so he was sitting me down trying to get me to learn these things. And I was just not having it. And yeah. then I, I didn't have any interest in playing music again until I was about 13. And he had kept on asking me throughout the years if I, was, if I would play bass, if I would give it a try. And I was like, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. I was doing art. I was more into drawing and stuff. And then, um, yeah, one day he wrote me in by teaching, by, you know, saying he would teach me Hey Joe by uh, Jimmy uh-huh. Hendrix. Because he was a massive Hendrix fan. And he sat me down and... I started playing it and immediately I was in love. I was like, oh my God, I could do this. I can like play this bass line that I've heard a thousand times and, and like be part of the music, part of, you yeah. know, like, like imagine I'm like in the band and like playing with them. That's so cool. And it was like right away, I was learning all the bass lines, all, all the, all this music that I was into at the time. And then shortly after that, a friend of the family who was also a bass player made me a slap bass mixtape. And it had like Ooh. Victor Wooten and it had Marcus Miller, Jonas Helborg, a bunch of other people that um, I don't think I ever learned the names of. And I was just, I started falling in love with some of the more like left to center bass players right out the gate. Like within a month mm. of playing, I was introduced to these players. And then I got into Primus, like anyone, you know, my age at the time, if you were a bass player, <laughs> you loved Primus. And uh, so yeah, I, I was obsessed. I started practicing. I started playing, um, uh, uh, diving really into it. And then my dad, being you know awesome and supportive and really excited that I was taking to it, started getting me gigs playing with him in oh, nice. his projects. And he was like, yeah. he's like you know a, a brilliant musician, and would would uh, always get hired to be sort of the musical director for different projects. And so. I'm like this 14-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid who has no business being there. You know, like I had mm-hmm. chops and whatever. I had like, you know, I could do like the fancy stuff, but I didn't know who I was as a yeah. player or anything like that. But he kind of just brought me into these these bands and had me play with people that were way better than me. And like they would say one thing, you know, about me rushing or about, um, you know, holding out certain notes longer Little things mm. like that, and I would really take to him because I didn't want to be, you know, I, I wanted to hold my own next to these players. Yeah. So, so um, between my dad and all these other people that were very patient with me and, and just really cool and monster players, I really learned um, the professional side of, of music. Uh-huh. You know, how to be a professional, how to really, like, do your homework and come to the gig prepared. And so uh, I'm really thankful for that. You know, even though it was music that wasn't really like what I wanted to necessarily be doing all the time. Yeah. Uh, I learned a ton and, I, and it forced me to have to learn a lot of music. So I developed my ear and um, yeah, like countless other things that I learned that um, I can't even trace back to it that I'm sure started there. That's crazy. So you were like thrown into the deep end pretty much from from the start. That's right so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That is insane. Do you think if you weren't thrown into the deep end that your journey would have been, I don't want to say slower, but it definitely would have been different if your dad hadn't taken you to these gigs? And Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, both my parents are very supportive and nurturing of that side. 
you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are in general. They're lovely people. Um, but uh, my mom is a like, she directs community theater plays. So I grew oh, up. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I grew up going to plays every summer and like spending them pretty much there with her and you know watching the band rehearse and mm-hmm. watching everyone like you know go over their parts and and just be creative in, in whatever realm. The people making the costumes, the people making the set, the actors, everything. And then it got to a point where um, me and my, the original drummer from my main project, um, Consider the Source, we grew up together. And he's, you know, a great drummer. And we started just doing all those plays together. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, so that was like another part of like my musical upbringing was not just playing with my dad, but also doing all these um, these plays where like, you know, I, I didn't love all of them, but, you know, you still learn a ton sitting in the pit yeah. in, any, in any play really you know you have to be really focused really patient you might have to sit out for like five or ten minutes and then come mm. right in so uh yeah you know I, I really had a very great um upbringing when it came to nurturing my creative side I'm very yeah. fortunate for that that's crazy I've had a lot of people's I call them origin stories like they're flipping superheroes but you kind of are really <laughs> but I've heard a lot of them and it. I think you yeah yeah you you really are though I'm not even like oh. saying that but you are um, <laughs> I've heard a lot I've heard a lot of them and I think yours is incredibly cool and I love that you have parents involved in the arts I actually was into theatre for a long long time theatre before music I studied performing arts for two years and wow. then when yeah and then when Covid hit I kind of realised that the performing arts, it just wasn't for me just because I saw how competitive it was. And again, I mean, I've mentioned my introversion, but I'm also incredibly anxious too. So the thought of like competing with the other, other people and doing all the auditions, I think I let that get to me a little bit, which I don't know, maybe I, I regret a little, but I've ended up here and I couldn't be any, any more grateful for it. I picked up bass playing in, in lockdown and it's it's changed my life. So I also love that your that your mom's involved in that. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and you know, I think there's something cool about like <clears throat> like you just said, like you wonder if maybe you know you, you wish it went different or you did something mm. different. Well, you know, we, we can't always know, and we have to be where we're no. at during those times. And now look at you, you know, you're you're doing great with bass. You have a successful page, and you know, it seems like it's thriving. So it's all about like the meaning we derive from things, what we do with yeah. them after the fact. But also, you yeah, know, what, exactly. what, what, one thing that I love about um, the music world, out of all the arts, I feel like um, there's room for everybody, you know, mm-hmm. whereas, you know, like I think with, with acting, you know, there's all these stories about people being more cutthroat, and yeah. and it being more competitive, like like really it obviously was crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I haven't been. I, I've seen it backstage a little bit, but I can only imagine like actually being part of it. What it the stress it would put on. Um, I'm I'm very happy that I'm a musician where like I can mm. do the weird stuff that I do, and you know, aside from a couple of the trolling comments every now and then, which is going to happen. It's and inevitable, it, really. Yeah, it, it it is. It is at this point. I um. I think of Stewie Griffin. I'm like, your anguish sustains me. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, but yeah, it's really cool that we have enough room, you know, in this, in this, um, subculture, whatever to Mm. be who we are. And if we just keep doing the thing that we do, we find our audience, they'll, they'll gravitate towards us. And, um, as long as you're doing it well and you're doing it honestly and, and, you know, you keep on doing it, I really feel like that's, um, that's a pretty cool trajectory. No, I completely agree, actually. And it's nice to hear you say it because I've not worked in the music industry really for very long at all, been a part of the industry for very long at all. But a, a part of me was like, well, if the acting industry I thought was competitive, then what about the music one? But hearing you say that, and I do agree from my experience, like there is space for everyone. You can be yourself a lot more. Like those two years I studied performing arts, it was so mentally draining competing with everyone not feeling like you're good enough and yeah that just I don't think I cried as much in those two years I have in my whole life it was hard it is a lot I respect people who are able to do it I really do 
And that's, that's not to say that the music industry isn't hard and there's not competitive moments in there. I spoke to someone, actually, who I think he studied classical violin and he spoke a lot about that, about competitiveness in, like, those kind of classical environments. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I guess Which I should. I can understand. I can imagine that, too. Totally. And that and I guess, yeah, that's a different part of the musical world that um, yeah. I guess I could I can make the statement I just made because I, I'm not in the academic world, really, uh-huh. you know, um, like, or not, not like the formally academic world like that. So um, but yes, there is that in the classical world. There's even that a little bit in like, you know, I guess any any major yeah. music school, you know, you can say that, that anywhere. And, 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 and even if it's not overt, you know, you have like, um, you're constantly around other people who are, you know, like I have, I have a couple of students that go to Berkeley and, mm. um, you know, I, I, I've observed over the years, just people who will go in and come out just super stressed or jaded, you know, yeah. and, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything about Berkeley as a, as an entity, but it's just a trajectory that people sometimes um, they, they feel pressure, they feel competition, mm-hmm. um, and where there, some competition is really good for us and could you know you know push us along. Um, when you have that much money sunk into it and that much pe- looming debt, you know that's yeah. like so yeah. much extra pressure and all this stuff on top of the just pressure you have of wanting to become a great player and wanting to get gigs and make that your living and everything. So, um, yeah, I wish that the, the whole narrative around all of it could change somehow, you know, and people could, mm. start, could, could go back to a time where they're doing it for a different reason, you know, and myself yeah. included, you know, I think it's just wrapped up. It's, it's um, embedded in our culture to, is. To, to thrive and be ambitious and all that. And um, where there is a place for it, I feel like we, we put aside the artistic really natural, really human side of it, of just mm-hmm. wanting and needing to express our life, you know, what, what our lives are and what happens in it yeah. and who we are. Um, that gets put to the side for all this other stuff. And we get stressed. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, you're so right. And that's such a great point. Like like you said, not calling out Berkeley as, you know, a thing in itself. But I think with those institutions, it is really hard and unavoidable for people to not be stressed and not, lose their kind of musical expression because like you audition to get into these places and then like you said you've got the financial stresses on top of it and then the people that you're surrounded by I think it's not just a Berkeley thing it's a it's a when you're educated in those environments that it's just unavoidable having that stress and and competition so were you did you not go to a music industry institution at any point I didn't um you know, I guess to kind of continue the 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 the, the origin story. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I I pretty much just jumped band to band. Um, uh-huh. You know, my whole uh, teenage years. After that, you know, while playing with my dad, playing with uh, my my drummer Justin, my buddy, and um, we were in a bunch of different projects together. You know, any side gigs. You know, if, if I was yeah. getting hired, he would get hired. That sort of thing. Oh. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just playing, and playing, and playing, and gigging all the time and just exploring the instrument. And if I was into slap bass, I would I would dive into it and try all sorts of stuff. I got into odd time signatures, dive into that, got into Indian music, dove into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when Consider the Source started, um, you know, it was it was I mean, it took a bunch of years for us to really start you know gaining any kind of momentum. But between uh, at that point, I was teaching lessons. And Mm -hmm. between that and the little bit amount of pay that we were getting from our gigs, I was able to sort of just sustain a career doing music between teaching and performing. And um, actually, I skipped one part, one big part. Um, I did stop playing for about a year and a half right before Consider the Source started. And it's because I you know, kind of like what we were saying a couple of minutes ago, music became something else for me. It was mm-hmm. completely wrapped up in my ego and completely wrapped up in like, I am only as good a human as I am on bass. And I'm only yeah. as good as the praise I get, you know? And, um, yeah, that, that was very, uh, unhealthy, very unhealthy, mm-hmm. very uncomfortable feeling to, um, 
latch on to that. And it was completely the op- total opposite of what music is supposed to be or any art is supposed to be, yeah. us, you know. Um, so I was kind of burnt out. And I wasn't happy playing, and I wasn't happy in any of the projects that I was in at the time. This is, you know, prior to Consider the Source starting. And so I, uh, in college, instead of studying music, I studied psychology and philosophy. And I was just going to do that. I mm-hmm. was going to, I was going to become a therapist, and I was going to wow. just do music as a as a hobby and relate to it, you know, in a different way. And I was pretty set on that for a couple of years, and. Then Consider the Source started in the middle of all that, mm. and we started gigging, and I started being able to, um, all the techniques that I was developing that didn't have a place in any of the gigs that I was getting, all of a sudden they could flourish, and they can really, yeah. like, you know, um, become something, and um, I could dive deeper and deeper into them um, with no holdbacks, you know, it was just, we were all just doing our own thing, we all have our own things that we like to explore and let's just see where this project can go with all of us having our own voice and you know no holes barred kind of kind of mentality when it came to just doing what you wanted to do and that's all I wanted out of music I didn't want to do Mm -hmm. the for hire thing anymore I didn't want to do cover gigs um it just wasn't wasn't what my interest was uh so when that you know when the band started and I was able to you know explore these things more I was like, all right, you know, I'm not doing psych anymore. I know I'll finish my degree just to no just therapist to, for me. Just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Save, saving people one one at a time. Nah, no. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do music for me. <laughs> well, you can still save people doing that. I'm sure you have. I'm sure there's a, um, so many people who are thankful for the for the music that you've made. So you could say you had a wider reach. I mean, you wouldn't know, but as a musician, then. Um, an alternative career as a therapist. It, it is. It is a beautiful thing that you know. Um, it, you know, we could kind of do what um, what is meaningful to us, and it does inspire other people for for the people that it does. So, yeah, very very fortunate. I think it's so cool that you were able to say that I took a year and a half off of playing, and you didn't know if you would ever do it again. I, that's just so cool of you to be open so open about i think that would help a lot of people hearing that yeah well you know it's it's um it was a tough time you know it was a tough yeah. decision to make and it was uh it was it was scary and it was a totally new uh, territory and for up at that point you know i guess i was like 20 when or 19 or 20 and i so i'd been playing for six or seven years at that point and it mm-hmm. but it was everything to me so um I was really bummed out, you know, in order to make that kind of decision. I was really just not not happy with it. But I think that the overarching lesson was, you know, you have to listen to to the to the messages, you know. Like if mm. your body's telling you something, if you're constantly stressed, then there's something that has to give. There's something that has to change. Something's not working. And it might be something within you know, it might be like how you're relating to yourself, it might be yeah. something about the circumstances you're in, but you have to do that investigation. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to grow the way you're supposed to grow. And so I definitely learned that from it um, as the years went on and really reflecting on it. And I'm so thankful that I did take the time because I was going to, I was, I almost broke, you know, I was bending, bending, Mm. bending. And it was almost to the point where I was like, no way am I ever doing music again. Um, It's tainted forever, you know, but it didn't get to that point. It was just, I needed to recalibrate. Yeah. And without doing that, you don't know, you probably could have got to a position where you gave it up forever who knows I think that's it's a really great message and I couldn't agree more of kind of listening to your body your head and what you need to do like you said sometimes it is something that you just need to work through personally so you might not be at the position where you need to take a year and a half off you might just be in a position where you need to switch your mindset and work harder on different things but I know I completely agree I think I think that's People are going to really appreciate hearing that. So what was, I know you mentioned that you aren't into reading music and still now aren't, I think you said you weren't weren't the best at it. What was, what's theory been like for you then? (laughs) Because I, I, from your story, I assume that it was, wasn't something that you focused on in the beginning. Yeah, certainly not in the beginning, but Mm -hmm. um, 
as as probably a lot of people know who are who will listen to this, um, you will reach a plateau, and <laughs> then um, you're going to be really frustrated, and then you're going to have to start from scratch in some area of music where. Um, you're not used to starting from scratch because now you've developed some technique and you've learned a bunch yeah, of songs yeah. and maybe you've written your own bass line. So it's very frustrating to, to you know, have to feel like you're starting from scratch somewhere. So what I do is, um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I do, um, I know a lot about theory and I, I, I have utilized it and uh, I'm not like, as I said, academically trained so there's a lot that I'm missing but what I what I do especially with my students and I, this is what worked with me so I teach it is I at least the very bare minimum go over the mm-hmm. modes and the and the arpeggios that belong to them which means the chords that belong to them because they're really the like the building blocks of western music so regardless of what genre you're in you'll get immense there are immense benefits to be um taken from that one concept mm-hmm. of just you know because if you learn the scales and then you learn the arpeggios and you learn the the um chords that go with them you can start jumping them around creating chord progressions you could start hearing um songs that you love and say oh man i always wanted to learn that oh wait a minute i'm hearing that now it's a that's a one six two five. Oh, okay mm-hmm. so that means it's like ionian aeolian dorian Mixolydian, so I can use those scales to navigate that baseline. You know, so um, once you reach a certain tipping point with that, you start seeing how things work. And it, it for me, that was like one of the biggest paradigm shifts, eureka mm. moments in my whole musical life. Like I learned the modes, I sat on them for a while, and I was like, great, I know them. Why did I learn them? Why do I know this? You know, <laughs> why did I spend What's so much all? time? With this? Yeah. And then, yeah, but then really it got to a point of me trying to use them where I was like, oh, this is like everything. And I, yeah. But it's a lot of it. It's a whole a lot. lot of it. It's a and, lot. And it's, it's a great place to, to um, build. So even if you start stepping outside a key and everything, like if you're learning even um, a Bach cello suite or something like that, there's a lot mm-hmm. of moments where he's changing keys and he's using these little, you know, little moments that you're like, huh, that's a weird no choice. But you can look at those as like, shifts like portals into a new key and then shifting back and then it's modal for a while you know Mm -hmm. but yeah so um theory is it is an important um i i I do study it and i have studied it um you know grow after a point after i stopped being a a, a petulant know-it-all child um which i was (laughs) which i was for for many many years um but uh yeah it's it's very helpful to at least have like a, a basic basic understanding and you know mm-hmm. I, I also should say that I think it depends on just what you want to do in your musical life I have one yeah. student who um, he, I've been teaching him for like 14 years now or something and he started because he wanted to learn rush covers and he still just wants to learn rush covers Love and, <laughs> and so, so our lessons are us just hanging out and you know uh, catching up <clears throat> making jokes and then we learn a rush song and and that's what he wants out of it you know like he I love that so much yeah and like yeah. you know he, he knows his modes he knows you know like I, you know I, I've I definitely taught him some basic stuff but if your connection to music is more casual and that's just mm-hmm. kind of like you just want to do that there's nothing wrong with that if no. you want to go to Berkeley and if you want to do all these other things then you have to you know you have to know your stuff in that regard yeah so um you know it really it really just depends yeah having i remember you saying when you were gigging with your dad you kind of learned to rely on your ear a lot was it when you started learning theory was it easier for you to hear the modes or hear what was going on before understanding what it was because i've spoken to a lot of people that say i don't know what this scale or mode is called but i know that it works was that something that you experienced yeah and and it's kind of cool seeing it um like watching other people experience it too. This is the way I did because, <laughs> you know, like I'll, when you learn a mode right out the gate, like if you're learning the Dorian scale, for example, you're like, I don't understand, like, what's the practical value of this? And then you start <laughs> playing funk and, and you start seeing all these, you know, root to octave to minor seventh to major six moves. And you're like, and then a minor third gets thrown in there. And you're like, oh, so wait a minute, Dorian could be like super funky. <laughs> oh, I'm hearing it now. Oh, now I get it. Okay. You know, um, 
you know, like, like Lydian is the, um, like the Simpsons theme, you know, things like mm. that. You start hearing them and different things and you're like, oh yeah, that's really, that's really pretty cool. I get it now. But yeah, when you first are learning them, you don't see the compare, you, you don't see the connection. You have to get your hands dirty with them before you start really seeing what they're about. It gets mm-hmm. activated after a point, I find, but, um, yeah, there's a little bit of a lag, I think. So even if like you're, you're learning, uh, you're, Maybe you created a bass line that happened to be in Dorian, and then you play a Dorian scale. You might not hear it right off the bat. No. You might, you might, you might not. It depends on you know all sorts of factors. But um, the more you play with it, the more you'll start making those connections. So you use quite innovative bass techniques in your playing, like two-handed slapping. Um, what's what's different about the way that you approach your bass practice to be able to have that sort of freedom in your playing? Oh man, so there's a lot. Um, there's a lot that has gone into my tapping practice. Mm. Um, so the pretty much I'll do. I have like scale based um, tapping exercises. You know, just you know, running your scales up and back, running them in two octaves. Um, scale pattern exercises, interval exercises, stuff like that. And then I have arpeggio exercises that um, you know ones that kind of make sense for the bass. Uh, mm-hmm. like if you take like the root, the fifth, the octave, and the third, I've done some Instagram reels, uh, lesson videos on these sorts of things, and um, <clears throat> I'll bring everything up modally. I know I keep talking about them. Um, <laughs> I bring them all up and uh, up and back, and that way, you know, you you have the lay of the land, and you can, you know, start experimenting. And a, a big part of my practice too is um, kind of setting my own parameters to improvise within. So once mm-hmm. I get an exercise down, right afterwards. I say, okay, um, let's say I put it in five and I'll use these chords as like a chord progression. Let me see what I can create with it. And I'll mm-hmm. say, okay, m- you know, maybe something cool came of it, maybe not. And then I'll pick another groove, another time signature, another key, and then just kind of poke around, see what the, uh, you know, see what it's about. Because sometimes we, uh, we, we learn exercises and then we're like, okay, I got it. Now what? We'll go to the next thing, you know? And so yeah. This this process of getting your hands dirty with it, and I I call it testing the waters. You know, I'll do it with myself. Um, I, I I I teach it as well. You you take a concept, and you you poke around creatively, and you see if it brings you anywhere. And if it doesn't, mm. that's cool. That's why you're just testing. You're just seeing. Because if uh, you know, the worst thing we could do in the creative realm is force an idea. So yeah, th- this is like a workaround for that. It's just like press a little bit, see if it goes anywhere. If not, cool. Look over here. Try something else. Yeah, I've I've talked to quite a, a few people who, in the beginning, are quite scared of improvising. What they're scared of is doing something that doesn't sound good. So they just won't they won't try, especially in the beginning. Obviously, when you're new to the instrument, like you you want to be doing things right and you want to sound good. But they're so they then won't improvise and then won't you know just do their own thing on the instrument because they're so they're so intimidated by sounding bad and so scared of sounding bad yeah but there's so so much good that can come from that and i i've had to explain to people that in the past i'm a little bit of a hypocrite because i don't do it (laughs) and i probably should do it more i will i will say that but i i I know in my head the extreme benefits of you know combining both theory and improvisation but i also am an advocate for just play like just play and have fun and see see what see what comes out if it's bad it's bad like you said doesn't matter we move on yeah and that's how we learn is you know we make millions and billions of mistakes and do things Mm -hmm. that sound terribly i've been playing bass 25 26 years and i still will have moments like that i'll have moments like that in front of people you know and and live you know solo sets i'll make terrible mistakes Uh you know it's just just it's fine you know do you think do you think that they notice that when you're playing live and you make a mistake do you think they notice or is it something that you're more conscious of so you know it really depends on the audience because uh, Mm -hmm. in in all the projects that i that i'm a part of uh you know we it it attracts you know nerdy musicians like me so they're a little bit more prone to hear those things when they happen um but i will say that i've gotten pretty good at over the years at um you know when, when something like that happens using it and trying to do something with it or if, if it happens to be a train wreck, you know, you just laugh it off because yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's part of the experience. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, you know, 
just when you're performing, you're trying to just give the audience like a little snippet of who you are and who I am as a dude who makes mistakes. I do it. I know like it's even when I'm recording, there'll be, you know, I'll leave mistakes in my, in my, some of my solo pieces and stuff like that and consider the source will do it. And any Mm -hmm. other, any, anything else that I'm a part of, you know, within reason, unless it's like, unless you really like lose the message of what the piece is by a, a certain mistake, I'll leave the blemishes in there because, um, yeah, that's that's what we are. We we yeah. we strive. We do our best. We sculpt and go through the heartache, and then we triumph and all that. And then you know, at the end of the day, we're still not perfect. It's, no, it's, it, it's cool. That's just what it is. It's it's we're humans. Yeah, it's so cool that you do that, and it does. It reflects a humanness, and it's normal. And we forget that because now, obviously, with the age of social media, you have the tools to be able to record 20,000 takes. 20,000 is a big number. That's quite an exaggeration. But, like, yeah. you can record all these takes and edit things to make everything seem perfect. And, like, oh, you know, people will watch your video and think, oh, they got that down, like, first take? That's crazy when behind the scenes it's, like... <laughs> uh, I was going to say one of the things I appreciate about your page is that you'll post videos where you're, like... Yeah, you'll bleep out your curses and you'll, mm-hmm. you know, like, like you make mistakes and, and you show everyone that like, yeah, you're just, you know, it's funny. Like, you know, the, like the videos are funny when you do it, but it's also yeah. like, you know, this is, this is the process. The process is you're trying something out and you make a mistake and then you, you know, you try it again, you try to get it better. And I'll do the yeah. same thing in some of my videos, you know, I'll, I'll just leave a, a mistake in the reel or I'll, I've done whole videos that are just based on like, or stories, I, I should say. Yeah, that's just yeah. like, you know, this is me messing up or this is, you know, Emily telling me I'm playing too fast. Or, and, she, she, and she's she's great because she really does, like, she really does keep me on my toes. Like, it's funny, but... Um, yeah, like I, that I, was she, a sweet moment. Yeah, she she's always, she, I'm always, like, showing her, I mean, the poor girl, she hears, like, hours and hours straight of me, like, editing a drum part for something I'm working on or working mm-hmm. on one bass line and... and cursing and, and you know damn it don't have it yet oh this and that and she's just going yeah. about her day very patient it sounds good baby <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. bless her no I do think it is important to show those things it's a way of like combating the perfectionism that comes with that's not me hating on people that don't share like their mistakes or outtakes like you're not obligated to share those things but it does help other people realize, oh, okay, I'm not alone. It's yeah. not bad that it took me 12 takes to get this. Like, it just happens. Like, does yeah. it mean you're a bad player? Yeah, and, and also um, I think it falls under the umbrella of uh, just the whole perceptual issue that we have on social media where we think things are a certain way. Mm-hmm. Like, we see a person do something crazy on an instrument and we're like, oh, man, they're just doing that all day just like that. I'll never get to that place man, that's, it's so, um, it's like, you know, for some people they might be inspired, but some people might be, uh, highly discouraged by that sort of thing. Yeah. And there's also like, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll go on vacation and bring my bass with me and I bring like a practice amp and I'll make videos wherever I am. Uh, and you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm making a living doing music, but I'm not rich. I'm not like, you know, whatever. And, and I, I had a student one day who, uh, came to the lesson and he was like, man, you know, what I want is like, I want what you have. I want to be, I want to like be all over the place and, and, and doing this and this and that. And, and he, he started painting a picture that wasn't accurate, <laughs> that I felt wasn't accurate about what my day to day life was. And I was yeah. like, let me, let me stop you for a second and just let you know, like, you know, like, and I got like a little bit into like what my, what my day to day life is. I'm like, I'm happy. Like things are good. But you know, um, You know, like when you see a video of me in like Costa Rica, like I worked my ass off for like a while, like all year to pay for that trip. And now I'm there and my girlfriend and I are are like hanging out and, and, you know, you know, being a little bit more like off the grid for a little bit. Um, But don't get me wrong. Like we have to play for the right reasons and we have to understand that what we're doing, what you're seeing online is, um, you know, like you're, you're filling in the blanks for the people that mm. you're that you're watching so you have to just you know just be very conscious of that sort of thing yeah you do and it's I bet it was a weird experience for you having someone relay what they see your life to be and it really not 
Like I now I'm thinking, what message am I putting out there? What blanks are other people filling in? What do they, you know, think my day to day life is? Because it probably most likely isn't what they think it is. That's so crazy. Like if someone was to say, oh, you do this every day because I've seen this on your Instagram. I'm like, no, that's not true. It's not. Yeah. It's not the reality. That that is insane that someone's actually like filled in those blanks for you and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in, it's interesting. Well, you know, it's um, where, where there's a lot of cool things about social media. There's a lot, you know, we can learn from so many people. We can watch these videos of people doing amazing things and um, uh, be inspired. And, uh, you know, we have all this. I mean, just like, you know, YouTube for years, but now with Instagram, it's it's really cool mm. that you that you can really um, in like a bite sized little way, uh, get a little piece of information that you might be able to work on that day. And that's really cool. So, and that's the positive side of it, but you know that the 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 negative side of it is is I guess it's just what people sometimes make it, mm. you know, and and we have to just be careful of that of that element of it. We do, yeah. Even even me who tries to have a very healthy relationship with social media, and when I'm on it, I have to remind myself that of course not everything I see is like the full the full truth. There's a lot of work that goes behind certain things and things that you don't see. But even me being conscious of that, I do sometimes slip into the negative headspaces. Like, you know, I'm not completely, you know, in the right headspace all the time. And sometimes it is social media that kind of tips that negative headspace for me. So even being conscious of it sometimes isn't enough and it does happen. Like it, it, it does, but yeah, I come back to it in the end. I'm like, Layla, this is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> yeah, put your phone down. Yeah. Go outside. <laughs> yeah. Literally, yeah. literally go outside. This is why also with your content and with your girlfriend, Emily, I love the fact that you're, you know, playing outside all the time that she'll be like working on balancing and writing poetry and you'll be there doing your thing, tapping or whatever it is you're working on that day. That's one thing that I think is so cool about the content that you do because, I mean, I I don't live in a very aesthetic outdoor place, but the outdoors is the outdoors. And I I do know that if I'm out there just going for a walk, doing something, that, like, life is just so much better. Like, I have a a way better perspective on life. But I also, I think it's really cool about where you are and the places that you go and where you choose to practice with Emily is I, I just think it's it's really cool do you choose to do that because it's a nicer environment for you and it's something that helps you mentally just be good yeah yeah it, it really it really does it, it really helps um recalibrate and for me I'm mm. like I'm a hermit by nature like if, yeah. if she didn't make me go outside, I, I wouldn't. I, I teach my lessons all day and I'm sitting right here and uh-huh. I'm doing that. And aside from like, you know, like maybe in the morning going to the gym or something and then I'm like in the car and then in the gym, I'm not really outside. Um, yeah. I, I would I would stay inside for like days on end and just do music stuff. And it's, you know, it's cool in a way, but it's also like, you know, you, you'll you'll especially during like the pandemic, like I would be inside for like two days straight or something uh-huh. and like not even realize it, you know, just working on, yeah. working on music, you know, recording stuff or whatever. Um, so, but the other side of that is when I am outside, I'm like, why, why wasn't I just out here this whole time doing yeah. this? Like as long as it's nice out, <clears throat> uh-huh. it's so much more inspiring. Um, you're breathing actual air. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it, it really does reset your mind, like going for a walk, going, you know, especially if you have like any water by you, walking by the water. Mm. Um, and, you know, and it's I remember reading something a long time ago about like like um, successful artists and writers and, and musicians and like habits that they had. And almost every single one of them went for walks like several times a day. Mm. Like it was just like a thing like they or at least like one long walk in the morning you know, and yeah. it really, you know, it's like we, if we're not in the habit of doing it, we don't really see the benefits. And then when we start doing it, um, yeah, like it, it's, it, it, there's something, um, I mean, just being outside is pleasant, but it's also something symbolic about it, you know, mm. like, like, I guess in the same way you have like the ritual of drinking coffee in the morning, if you're a coffee drinker, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, um, you know, you, 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 the whole process is almost like, like ritualistic, like you're excited about yeah. it. You smell the coffee, right? You take your first sip. Ah, oh, that's so good. Um, 
the same thing with going for walks. You can go for a walk and you're like, okay, this is my time to put everything aside. I'm, I'll leave my phone or if I bring it, I'm not looking at it. Um, mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have like a lot of nice birds around here. We have ponds, we have trees, all this stuff to look at and just disconnect for at least an hour, you know, every now and then. Um, yeah. And the practicing outside, too, is just uh, that's something I did actually um, growing up. My dad used to do it. He would go sit down in our we, we know we grew up in, in Queens, New York. So it was like very um, apartments everywhere. You know, there wasn't that mm-hmm. much um, you know, nature wise. Um, but he would always sit outside on the steps <clears throat> and practice. And I took to that when I started playing. And so, um, when I remind myself not to be a hermit, I, the first thing I do is go right outside and practice there. Yeah. yeah. Very, very inspiring. Def- different headspace completely. Yeah. It's so cool. Even you saying that you're a hermit most of the time and that like in lockdown you spent days and didn't even realize it. I'm the exact same. I could be in the house for days on end and not really like it's not really an issue for me. I'm not someone that feels an urge to have to be outside all the time. But when I am exactly how you said, like it is, it is, you know, I realize why am I why aren't I doing this more? This is actually very fun and refreshing but then it goes back to the perceptual issue we were just talking about because I with your content watching it I then just filled in the blanks in my head and assumed that you know I mean obviously this isn't very rational because of course you'd have other things to do but I'm like oh John is you know spending a lot of his time outside and you know he's practicing and all the time's a bit excessive but like many hours of the day outside that's like literally just I've just realized I've filled in your the blanks to your life and then yeah. you now just told me actually I'm a hermit that uh teaches people lessons all day and my girlfriend has to force me to go outside yeah um, yeah that, 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 that is that is more than the, the reality of it I, I do force myself to go out more now that you know that, with her influence but um mm-hmm. even right before this the podcast I had to say okay John open up the window, it's right next to you, just open up the window and get some fresh air, because you know, otherwise you'll just be like, you know, like stuffy, and um, you'll start getting hot in the apartment, mm-hmm. and then you won't do anything about it, because that's the way you are. <laughs> so, yeah, I have to, I have to do, I, I, I have a term called John proofing, I have to John proof my life. I love yeah. that. That's so funny. My term is Layla logic, which is, oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> Because I, I'm also like things like, like you said, like opening a window. If I'm hot, I just won't do it. Or this is really silly, but like when I need to go to the toilet, I'll procrastinate. Yeah. And I don't know what the Layla logic is behind that, but like to me, getting up to go to the toilet is just something that, although I need it, I'll procrastinate. <laughs> like yeah. it's just, it's just well, a bit. Well, especially if you're doing something else and you're like fixated on whatever uh-huh. that thing is it's like you can't be bothered by that <laughs> yeah. you, just, you just want to do the thing that you're doing and everything else is just an annoyance um, yeah no and, it and is it's, it's silly but that's but that's i think you know we get locked into that kind of thing like i'll, I'll be i'll do the same thing i'll i'll be working on like a, a song like in logic and mm. i'll be starving and i've been starving yeah. for hours and i'll just, all i need to do is the kitchen's right there. Just go right there and eat. Take two bites of something, and then I'll be fine. And I won't do it. I'll start getting a headache. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, you, you haven't had any water in like five hours. Oh, anyway, I'm just gonna keep on <laughs> blasting this loud music at myself, even though I haven't. And I could just go and get a glass of water. So yeah, yeah. I, need, I need to be saved from myself. No, I'm I'm the same though. Like, actually, I've learned I'm I've learned a bit better now. I get really hangry, and I can't not eat I've learned a bit of my lesson here and I know say if I'm trying to record a cover I know that it's probably not going well for me because I've decided not to eat (laughs) so I will have to consciously take a break and say Layla if you just eat something this experience will be so much more pleasant than it is right now so take a break stop this Layla logic that's going on and eat something and then (laughs) carry on (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We, ha- we have to learn. We have to learn what our what our um, our things are mm. and, and work around them. Yeah. 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 John proofing was a, is a funny term that I came up with to um, to combat the things that um, I just know I'll do. Like 
I'm forgetful. I'm very, very forgetful. So as soon as I <clears throat> like book a student with a lesson or something like that, uh-huh. I write it in the calendar immediately. If we, if, if like we're doing a lesson currently, it's the end of the lesson. And I say, okay, uh, next week, Tuesday at four o'clock before we hang up, I don't let them hang up until I put it in the calendar. You put it down. <laughs> yeah. It's an order of operations thing. Like if I hang up first, I just won't do it. And then four o'clock the following week will come and I'll miss the lesson. So I just, I I, I won't get better. My memory won't get better. I know Mm -hmm. that. So I just have to have better habits to combat the, the things, you know, the, 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 uh, issues that I have. (laughs) (laughs) You've learned to manage it, which I feel like is all that you can do really. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, 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 you know, kicking and screaming. I've gotten to a point where I can uh, manage. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's like cheat codes. I'm like, I know, I know I'll be fine if I just d- do this. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So your playing incorporates a large range of genres and takes inspiration from world music, like uh, Indian rhythms, for example. Who, who are your biggest inspirations and where did your interest in those come from? So um, I got really more into it when the band started, when Consider the Source started. Our drummer mm-hmm. and our guitarist were, uh, they kind of bonded over their interest of it. Yeah. And they actually went to India together and studied. And so, you know, my, th- they were showing me some stuff and I got I started getting into it. And then I realized that a bass player that I always loved from, I mentioned him earlier on, his name is Jonas Helborg. Mm-hmm. He's a g- great, great, great bass player, very unique I was into him when I was a kid because his slap bass technique was phenomenal. Really, uh, very, very cool. No one was really quite doing it like him. And then I started noticing that he was doing kind of an Indian fusion thing. Mm -hmm. So I was already like, you know, as a kid trying to replicate his sound, you know, I was really just so inspired by him. And then I saw that and I was like, oh man, let me like, let me see what this is all about. So I started listening more to his Indian fusion stuff which is so cool. It's like him and um, this guitarist, Sean Lane, who sadly passed away many years ago. Unbelievable. Like one of the, one of the most emotionally potent shredder guitarists. Mm-hmm. You know, like it really had something to say. It was very, very cool. And, uh, and then these, these three Indian musicians, two percussionists and a vocalist. <clears throat> and I just became obsessed with this project. I was just, uh, listened to all their albums. They have a, a really cool, uh, uh, DVD at the time uh, it was called Paris, like the Paris concert. It's on YouTube. It's really, really amazing. And uh, then I started just on my own, kind of studying Indian music. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, buying books on it when they were around. Um, I started taking lessons with a, a, this guy named G- uh, Ganesh Kumar. He plays Kanjira, which is sort of like a. It looks like a tambourine. Yeah. Um, but you could bend the pitch. It has like just one little like tiny symbol on it and such a cool sounding instrument. And when you see someone really rock it, it's like they're playing a whole drum set. It, sound, it really sounds like that. You mic mm-hmm. it a certain way. So, yeah. Such a cool instrument. And I started seeing how it worked so well with slap bass. Like, the, like when you heard Kanjira next to um, it, just the technique, the slap bass technique, it just sounded so cool. So um, it worked so well together. So I started just diving crazily into Indian rhythms and trying to incorporate them into my slap bass technique. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it honestly was one of the main things that that uh, another you know huge paradigm shift in my playing was just like um, seeing how they break down these large complex rhythms into just twos and threes, like smaller numbers that they yeah. use to just create these really large elaborate. Um, beautifully uh, constructed rhythms and you know some of them are like they're like playing a math problem you know like like you have to have every every to the 16th note everything has to be dialed in perfectly in order for mm-hmm. it to like land back on the downbeat and what that does to your sense of rhythm unbelievable so so cool so anyway um I got really, really, really into that. And then it started over time, whether I realized it or not, it just started seeping into the way I, I just uh, was rhythmically. Mm-hmm. Like, even when it, sto- it stopped sounding like Indian music and it started just being this tool that I could utilize to yeah. write more complex stuff. So 
um, you know, I use it with my slap bass and all the different, you know, rhythms that I gravitated there, that gravitated to with that technique, I transferred it to tapping. And then all of a sudden, like, these ways of stacking twos and threes and these cool, interesting uh, grooves that I, w- I became really comfortable with, it was like, okay, let's just see how they can exist in this technique and in this realm. And the, the, the cool thing is from, from studying Indian music, a big part of it is... Um, it, uh, actually, I did a reel on this recently on uh, conical, which is voice percussion. Mm-hmm. So if you start speaking these rhythms, it's that idea of like, if you could speak it, you can play it. You start speaking the rhythms first, your body starts understanding them. And then, you, you know, you put your technique, you mix your technique with that. And there you go. You have something really cool and more new, rhythmically nuanced than you might have had uh, if you worked on it some other way. So, uh, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I love listening to Indian music and uh, going to a classical Indian music concert is like one of the most unbelievably beautiful experiences you can have, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in the musical world. Um, but also the other side of it is what you derive from learning it is is immense. Yeah, I feel like I need to d- dive into that. You sold me the whole and it makes a lot of sense that the thing the things that you're open to now rhythmically like you said like it you utilize what you've learned it doesn't necessarily sound like it's taken from indian music but it's given you a whole new outlook on rhythm i think i need to i'm definitely go i'm going to go look back at all of your reels and do some researching <laughs> cuz it's definitely something that i feel like i need to i need to get on yeah yeah and so there's a book called it's it's a really silly title you could taka d me this <laughs> Takademi is like the, ver- the 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 verbal, you know, whatever. I'm way writing that it. down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny because it's like you, you laugh at it and you're like, okay, no one gets this. But if you get it, it's like if you get it, it's still kind of like lame, but lame funny. Like, yeah, like, yeah. I, I, you know. That's my favorite so type I, of funny. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I, I I feel like I know this the guy who who made it, even though I've never met him. But yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really great book. He did a really good job putting it together and. um wealth of knowledge on how you can start incorporating it into your day-to-day just musical life even if Mm. you're not going to do anything really Indian music related just the concepts of it he he lays it out really well yeah I'm gonna take a look into that and that's a great name I love that yeah um you obviously mentioned that you spend a lot of time teaching students and I know you've done it for a long time because you said you had a student for over 10 years how has teaching affected your growth as a musician? Is there anything that you felt like that you had to improve on to be a better teacher or instructor? Because it's not easy. Not everyone can, not everyone's equipped to teaching people. What was that like for you? Yeah, well, um, I grew up, you know, growing up around music, my dad teaches as well. So, mm. you know, as a kid, I'd be like four or five years old, come out of my room, my dad's teaching a lesson in the living room. So it was a natural thing for me to, to try to get into yeah. after a point. Uh, and I always have really enjoyed it. Uh, I love seeing um, my students progress. And um, the advantages of it for me, on top of just that element of it, is, you know, seeing the meaning that other people derive out of learning more and getting better, is I, if someone asks me a question about, you know, how do you do that thing on whatever song, I might, like, have to reroute and say Mm. you know i don't know let me let me like let me look at it for a second let me like relearn the part and or if i have to sometimes i do and (laughs) say yeah what am i doing here what what's the implied harmony like what am i like um what chord does this belong to what key is this in what time signature is it in but sometimes um it makes me look back and reflect on my own stuff and and you know see what it's about and other times it's even simpler things um like basic theory questions uh someone will ask me and all of a sudden in answering it and trying to be thoughtful about it 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 just helped me dig deeper into some basic you know ideas Mm -hmm. that maybe i overlooked or never really put you know put the things together yeah it's you you learn so much from teaching because you have to be on your a-game you have to be you do yeah yeah someone someone is um putting their you know like paying you money and and hoping that you'll be able to guide them so you don't you mm. know you want to really um 
you know, uh, uh, make sure that you're answering in a way that's that's honest and thoughtful and accurate, mm. ultimately. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it makes you really look closer at things, which is, uh, you know, something I think we need to do in general, just in our musical life, you know, look closely at, you know, not just the theory realm, but just in any part of it, like, why are we doing this? Why are we, mm. you know, why are we playing this note? Why did we play that note? Was that, you know an ego move without a spiritual move, you know, what's, what's going on. So, uh, yeah. Did you feel any, I know you said that obviously you have to be thoughtful about your answers because obviously you're teaching somebody. Do you, and have you at a point felt really pressured because of that? Was teaching ever something that you were like, Oh, there's a lot of pressure here. Or is it, was it just something you were just like? Yeah. Well, so sometimes, although I think, I think at this point, I, I kind of um, teach the way I teach, and I have mm-hmm. my strengths and I have my weaknesses, and I'm very honest with my students about what those are. Yeah, you know, so um, like teach like reading. I could teach someone to read, but I'm not great at it. You know, mm-hmm. so if if someone is coming to me and they want to learn to sight read, I say, look, like if there's other things that you want to learn, you know, from me, I will teach you those things. But I I can teach you how to read. I can't teach you how to get that good at reading. Like, you, mm-hmm. you, you, let me, let me, you know, I've, I've definitely had some students that wanted to learn a certain thing. And there's other players that I've, like, even other guys on Instagram that are, that I either know or just know through Instagram will say, you know, th- who you really want to study with is this dude or, th- yeah. or this person, you know, like, like they, they're really good at that thing. It's not my strength. So uh, because I, I kind of take that approach right out the gate, um, I I feel more comfortable that it's in my wheelhouse of knowledge to teach whoever I'm teaching what they want mm-hmm. to learn. So instead of being like feeling the pressure, um, I'd rather just make sure that they're set in a direction that's going to get them where they want to go. I I have one student who's studying some things from me and some things from another guy, who's you know like a really killer finger style jazz player. Mm-hmm. And I'm not that, you know, like yeah, I, my yeah, finger yeah. style is like pretty good, but it's like I, I use it more for like, you know, rock and progressive rock kind of stuff and other weird. I don't know what to call them things. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, uh, you know, it's yeah. And that way I kind of feel like I'm helping out the community a little bit more too. Mm. you know, get, giving some some lessons to some people who I think are more, you know, fit the bill a little bit more. Yeah, I asked David the same que- question, actually, and we kind of said the same thing as a thing of, you know, it's all about being honest about who you are as a player and the things that you're good at and not good at. And then yeah. being open and honest with your students, then there's no room for, there's room for pressure, of course, but like, there's there's a lot less room for it because you are being very open and honest about your capabilities, your interests and what they can learn from you. Um so right. yeah, I completely agree. Me and David did speak about that. Many musicians struggle with self-confidence and imposter syndrome. Do you recall any moments where is this something that you deal with frequently or have dealt with at a point in your career? Yeah, you know, um I I guess I'd have to analyze myself more to see if I'd call it, you know, what what would be considered imposter syndrome, mm. but I've I've certainly had um you know, moments of being really, you know, depressed or really bummed out over, you know, certain elements like the, the, the trajectory of, of my career at certain parts of my life yeah, or um, wasn't happy with where I was as a player and things like that. And now, um, you know, the, the, there's still traces of it, but I try to relate to those things a lot differently. You know, I try to look at those things as like messages of saying something needs to change. Mm. And, and I, I feel like we become a lot more malleable when we, when, when we try to apply creativity to even our own mental stuff, you know, and how we, how we handle those moments. So, like, I, I have, um, so, imposter syndrome, I feel like that term, I've, it, it became more popular in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Where I've, I've been hearing it more. I had even a student recently tell me that it's, it's been, like, a, a problem for him for a long time. And... Where I do see, I mean, you know, I was a psych major. I do, I do see the value in labeling certain mental and emotional mechanisms that, yeah. that, that we, we tend to get. I feel like sometimes when we hear terms like that and we identify with them, 
it's almost like right as soon as we have that moment we start saying i'm a person with imposter syndrome yeah yeah yeah. you know and where there is a, a good part of that where we can call it something and then maybe through diagnosing it do something about it on the other hand if we're not careful it might take us over and mm. we might say like oh well i guess that's just this this thing i have let me um you know I, I don't really know what to do about it. I guess that's just, I, 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 it's, it's, it's me. And I think if instead we sort of look at it as like something that's, um, our personalities are malleable. Mm -hmm. They can be, you know, we can have, we have more sway over them than we realize. Then we can look at why we feel like we have that thing. Why do we feel like we have imposter syndrome? Is it, is it, um, real? Like, are we, are we, are we just phoning it in <laughs> or, um, <laughs> Or, uh, or, or am I just kind of feeling bad about myself for some other reasons, you know? Yeah. And, and in that process, you know, uh, we can start getting to the bottom of more of like who we are. And that has a one-to-one -one relationship with our playing, mm. you know? And, and I think also uh, in that same thought, our, um, our playing... I don't know if you've, you've if this has happened with you if you've been sitting and just like practicing for like a long stint you know mm. like at, at at some point like if you're like an hour or two into playing you start like your brain starts figuring out other life things at the same time almost because I, I, I look at it like because when you're practicing it's like meditating mm -hmm. it can be right it's you're focused on one thing but sometimes our brain goes some other places but it, it stills the water because we're focused on on a given thing. And sometimes we start figuring out some just other life stuff while we're yeah. in that while we're in that place. And sometimes we don't realize we are, but connections that we make in that realm is like a microcosm of other stuff in our life in general. And um, I don't know how I got there, but if you haven't noticed, I like to go on tangents. But um, I think there's something really cool about that, and that could be sort of um, I don't know a, a combat to some of the. Uh, you know, some of the more negative head spaces we can get into sometimes when we're playing. Yeah. No, I think for me, the imposter syndrome feeling just comes from an overall lack of confidence in not just my playing at times, but I think my expression just as a person. And knowing that means that I'm aware of the stuff that I, I, I need to, you know, be working on. I do agree. I think diagnosing it sometimes as imposter syndrome a lot of the time a lot of the times I don't think it is that I just know with me that those imposter syndrome like feelings come from uh, an overall lack of confidence which I'm very much aware of and still are working on but it, it takes time I don't know if that's relatable to other people who have those feelings um but I, I think in a way it, it is rooted in you know having not much belief in yourself and your abilities and not realizing that you're capable of so much more than your, your brain likes to tell you. And I have to tell myself yeah. that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a thing I've struggled with, um, on and off. I mean, as I said, I, I stopped playing for a while because mm. I was like, I, I related to things in a very unhealthy way. Um, the beautiful part of having music in your life consistently is that, um, in the not only in the expression of it, but in the practice of it, mm. we can work through a lot of these things. You know, it 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 um it really is an amazingly healing um, way to spend your life. It's really I I really I I've had so many instances of of um, getting over things, you know, because mm -hmm. of it. And um, uh, like as I said, the practice of it too, you start seeing your own tendencies, mm -hmm. like. You know, if you're like what one thing I used to do is I would have a my practice routine written out and then I'd have a practice journal. So when once I was done with my practicing for the day, I'd write in the journal. I'd say, OK, how'd you do? So I started playing at noon and I did my warm ups and I and then I went into my scale exercises and then I was hungry 
and then I made a sandwich, and then I sat down in front of the TV, and I watched my favorite show, and so 45 minutes later, I got back to practicing, you know, and then you start noticing just what your tendencies are, and sometimes it's like, it wasn't just that I was hungry, it was that I was anxious, is that I was practicing, and I wasn't doing so well, and I needed instant gratification, I needed, I needed like a dopamine boost yeah. for a second, because I was feeling bummed uh-huh. out that I wasn't getting this thing down, so you start learning about yourself, if you're really looking closely in those moments, and then you could say, oh, okay, so I do that. Next time I practice, I have this all written down. I'm going to force myself to play a little bit longer, even if it's uncomfortable. And I'm going to see if I end up, you know, getting more out of it and feeling better from yeah. the practice session afterwards. And sure enough, you, you will. You know, it's the sort of thing where you can really use it to get into a better place just in your in your life in general. Yeah. It's very cool. It's like this, this self, self-feeding um, kind of ecosystem <laughs> uh-huh. where, cool. did, where, where did you get that base journal idea from because i'm gonna steal that i've not no i've not heard anyone use that before i think that's a really cool it, idea it's all yours um yeah. and i don't know I, I i don't know where i got it from um you know it might have just been that i was just maybe journaling in general at the time and yeah, thought, yeah. like you know i i i got i could get kind of obsessive when i'm when i'm you know and you know working on certain projects and at that the time I started doing that, I was working on, um, I don't even remember, it might have even been like the Indian rhythmic stuff, mm-hmm. but I was so obsessed with getting better at these things that I was like, anything I could do to hold myself accountable, I'm going to do. And the idea that I came up with was having the journal as opposed to just the practice routine. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, it helps so much. I have to get back to doing it. Lately, yeah. I haven't had the best practice routine just because I'm so busy with you know, with teaching and, and with, um, touring and everything. So, um, my, my playing is more maintenance than it is progress. So I haven't had yeah. as much of a need to do the journal thing these days, but, um, in my, in my earlier years, um, oh my, uh, it's so helpful, unbelievably helpful. And you have to be honest yeah. with yourself. You have to be like, this is exactly what I did. And these are the reasons I did them. If you were really mm-hmm. hungry, then good. Write that down. I, I, yeah. I Okay. Let yourself off the hook. You sure. have to eat. <laughs> yeah, like, we do yeah, have you, to you, eat. You, you, you have you have your you know your your hangry issue. So you have to. I make do sure have you don't my hangry issue. Yeah. Yeah. I have people in my life that can testify to that. I do have a hangry <laughs> issue. <laughs> no, I'm definitely. I'm going to use that. I think. I think a lot of people have accountability issues, and I I also do. That is something that I struggle with as well. I I can see. I've never done the base channeling before, or channeling in general, really. I think I tried it for a period, um, but even just hearing you talking about it, I can I can already see the the benefits that would come come with it. And I also appreciate you saying that sometimes you have to sit through it, even if it is uncomfortable, because it is true. We don't yeah. always want to practice all the time. But then again, yeah. yeah. But then, like you said, right now for you, it's just been maintenance and that's okay too. Um, but yeah, not neglecting yeah. it completely. I think that's really going to help me, actually. I am going to I am gonna use that. So how do you work through creative blocks? Do you experience them often? Is the journal something that you use for that or...? Yeah, well, in a roundabout way, um, you know, like, like without formally journaling the way I used to, um, the, the benefit that you get from, from journaling is self-reflection, mm. mm-hmm. you know, and, um, you get to like, you know, learn yourself. It's like you're talking to yourself, but, um, you have the time to put things more eloquently and find the right words and everything. Um, so, you know, creative blocks for me at this point, uh, they don't happen as much, but part of that is because I've kind of rebranded it to, to mean something out to, nice. to be something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because if if you look at it as that, you know, you can be, get really frustrated. And um, when you have frustration, you have tension, and that's the creativity killer. So what I do is, uh, actually, I kind of mentioned it before, that the testing the waters approach, where, you know, this is how I approach it myself. I'll sit down with a certain shape, you know, like a, an exercise or a, or a shape that I just found, or a chord that I just found, or a certain voicing of it. And I'll just see where it goes. Mm. And if it doesn't want to go anywhere, I don't get frustrated. I just say, okay, cool. All right, let me try something else. Maybe something else is ready to 
something else is ripe, you know, and ready to <laughs> yeah. get, get a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, 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 but that's you have to have sort of like a um, <clears throat> a hands off approach with it, because otherwise, you know, it, like you have to push a little bit and you have to try. But, you know, if you bend it till it breaks, then you're just running into a wall constantly, constantly, constantly. And I spent many years mm. um, very frustrated. I would work on technique and not yeah. work on creativity. Um, so my technique was like better than, it, you know, me 10 years ago can can do things, can you know, that me now can't do because I was very, very, very obsessively working on certain things. Um, but then I got to a point where it's like, that's 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 silly. Like, why do I need to do all those things? They're not they're not helping me. Let me let me foster the creative side more and learn more about, you know, that and how to bring that out more. So mm-hmm. I got to a point <clears throat> Where, uh, yeah, I started to, to develop this way of going about it where it was like, um, uh, I have all these songs. I have a list of songs that I'm like, that's currently in my rotation that I'm, you know, developing. I have other ones. Like if I have a solo gig, yeah. um, I have all my, I have a list of all my songs and I say, okay, I haven't played that one in a while. How the hell do I play that one again? All right, <laughs> let me see. And, and so I'll go over them and, and brush up on them. And then for the ones that, you know, sometimes old songs, I want to, you know, revamp them a little bit or mm-hmm. if there's new new songs that I'm working on, whatever the case may be, I'll um, I'll see if they're ready. I'll see if they want to go somewhere because we can't always control our level of tiredness, our busyness, you know, for working yeah. a lot, um, our state of mind in any given moment. We, we have some sway over it, but um, if an idea is not there for whatever the reason is, we can't even figure out what it is is it possible to figure it out you know uh, in, in a lot of the cases we have to just say cool you know i'll come back to you and and we'll see and sometimes the next day it's ready sometimes a year down the road it's ready mm. literally sometimes five years down or 10 years down the road it's ready so we wow. have to, so if that if that's really the case yeah like I'm, I'm working on songs now for a new project that i'm that i'm um developing that i wrote this song on a task game recorder when i was like 21 Wow. You know, the, yeah. So this was this was, you know, a long, long time ago. And now it's finally coming out in a project of mine and it's, you know, achieving its ultimate form. Mm-hmm. You know, now it's like now it's ready to be, you know, turned into something. But anything that I had tried over the years, I tried it and consider the source. It didn't work there. I tried it as a solo thing. Didn't work there. So um, we have to just learn to be cool with that, with the process being what it is. It's like. You know, the muse is either there or it's not. Mm. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's still other things to do. There's always techniques to work on. There's always, um, you know, uh, m- maybe, if, you know, you're working on this. If you want, you really want to finish this one song that's not ready, there's other things to, to do. There's other songs to work on, Other maybe a chorus of one song you can yeah. develop there, you know. So when you look at it like that, with more of a hands-off approach, the, the silver lining is that, you end up being more creative and mm. your ideas end up flowing better because you're not put, you've learned to not put pressure on it. But yeah. even still, you know, the, then the balance of it is if we get excited about that and we know that, that works creatively, then we start using that as like a, te- a, a thing. And then all of a sudden we're back to putting pressure on it. Yeah. So it's, a, it's like this mental, emotional dance that we have to kind of have where we just have to know that our brains are these fickle things. And we mm. have to work with the way it is, you yeah. know, and not force it to be something that it isn't. Yeah, and the point of there's always something else to be working on is actually a really great point because you can get so zoned in on the one thing. Maybe you're, you know, aren't feeling so creative on it or have a block on it. But like you said, there's that other thing that you could be doing. So, yeah, always. that's really cool. There's always that's, something else, yeah. Yeah, it switched my perspective a little bit because <laughs> you can nice. get so caught up in the moment of like, oh, I really want to get this done and this is my focus. But I'm like, if it's not working, that's fine because you've got that to do or that to do or something else to do. Just like redirecting yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's, I don't I don't know why I'm, I didn't have that perspective before, but it's definitely been switched. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah, of course. So consider the source was obviously a very important turning point in your life, obviously, were the reason why after your year and a half break that you kind of got in back into everything i know this can be an impossible question for people but do you have a favorite album or song 
off of consider the source. Or mm. there could be one that emotionally ties back to a time that was super substantial to you. I don't know. Do you have a, a one that sticks out or a few? Yeah, well, well um, I think if you ask me the same question on different days, I'd have different answers. But yeah. To, but today I would say um, <clears throat> as far as an album, there was one that we did. It was a triple album because we're progressive rock nerds and that's what <laughs> progressive rock nerds think is cool. Um, and, uh, we will never do it again. Um, but, but, but it was, uh, it was at a, uh, the album was written during a kind of a tumultuous time in the band's, uh, career because our original drummer had left mm. and, you know, we, we were like, you know, we, at the time we couldn't fathom the band without him, without any of the three of us. So, uh, it was very scary. <clears throat> And also, uh, during the time, me and our guitarist, Gabriel, we, we write all the songs, or at least write all the initial ideas before we all put our two cents in. And um, we were just writing and writing and writing. We had a ton of material. But then we had this big lag where we had a, you know, um, we had a, a second drummer for like six months and it didn't work out. And then we have a current Ooh. drummer that, that worked out. So time just kept going on we kept writing new stuff and we already have we were already ready to record an album when he left the band so more and more songs more and more songs more and more songs <laughs> and yeah we got to a point where we're like okay we uh we're gonna record with our new drummer you know like a year or two after he joined whatever it was and so yeah we had like three albums worth of stuff and we recorded in one studio and then we had another guy mix it and um we just feel like the album came out sonically really beautifully. Mm. It, you know, it was a struggle. We had like some issues, you know, during the, the, uh, the tracking process. Um, but the, the guy that, uh, did the mixing did a great job. Um, his brilliant, um, engineer did a great job. Uh, his name is Jocko out in, um, I think he lives in somewhere in Western New York and, uh, you know, resonates you know well with a bass player someone named Jocko so yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah he, he did an exceptional job on the album and it just sounded great and a lot of the songs on it were like just you know very very meaningful and, and everything so you know that one I'd say as far as an album as far as a song uh, we have a song called It Is Known and that was on an album of ours called You Are Literally a Metaphor and that song for me is is uh one of the more meaningful ones because it was written from a very emotionally potent place mm -hmm. i mean all all, the, all of our songs are you know we try yeah. not to we not we try not to write cerebrally you know we try to write emotionally and so this song was um without getting too too heavy into it 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 had to do with just the concept of death mm -hmm. and how it, you know, we, we, it affects us all, obviously, it has to, or if it hasn't yet, it will, and so uh, I kept thinking about it and becoming fixated on it for this particular uh, time in my life, for whatever reason, and, you know, this, this melody just sort of was born from it. It was like one of the first experiences I ever had where it was like, um, completely like out of my hands. It just mm. like, it just like came out. And, wow. and so, you know, wrote a chord progression with it, wrote the melody. Um, and, and what we do in the band is we don't, we don't, um, if one of us brings the initial idea and we don't, um, maintain ownership of it, we give it to each nice. other to yeah. write, write our own parts, maybe write whole new parts. So, um, so I wrote that initial part and I wrote, uh, you know, most of the other sections, our guitarist wrote this beautiful chorus, this, um, reharmonization of the chords underneath it. And, um, and he just plays it beautifully and takes a beautiful solo on the song. And just the whole way it came out was just really, really, um, I, th I thought sonically it came out really beautifully. Everyone played really well on it. And, um, yeah, I was just very, very proud of it. And it was, it's just like, uh, for me, it was one of the most authentic, um, just beautiful moments writing a song and, and working on it with my bandmates, mm. you know, and, uh, you know, like we, like Gabriel has brought in some, uh, you know, uh, outstanding 
um, song ideas. Like we, you know, we we we, we kind of go half and half with it. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, there's a lot that he's brought to the table too that are just like you know, like some of the you know most beautiful ideas and and so much fun to work on. So yeah, as I said, if you were to ask me tomorrow, I might come up with one that he brought a to the table. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like you guys have a really nice and healthy dynamic. Like consider the source as a band that you work very well with each other creatively. I like that you said you don't. Where if someone brings an idea to the table, that's not like ownership straight away. I think I think that's a really nice dynamic. Has there, has there ever been points where it's been hard to work with? Not necessarily those guys, but like other people in general. Has there been moments where it's been difficult? Yeah, of course. You know, and um, you know, we've had uh, we've had issues in the band. Mm. Uh, you know, between the three of us, between you know, two of us here and there. You know, in the creative process and whatever, it's a it's a relationship. It's going to happen. Any band in history, you're going to have yep. you know, those issues. And you know, and over time, we've grown and we've changed, and we're you know we're different people and we're different musicians and. Um, we, you know, we were very, very proud of the band and it's doing well. And it's somehow we can play this weird stuff and have a fan base and <laughs> you know, like, tra- tra- travel all There's over. There's a market it, so. for it. There, there is. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we, we've said from the beginning, we're very, very fortunate that we can do it. But, you know, we also, um, one of the ways of, of mitigating the, the issues where, um, maybe we don't see eye to eye on, on mm. things is we have other projects. You know, yeah. like like being able to have a solo project and have my new project, Mono Means One, where it's more of like a, a, a elaborate version of my solo project. Um, I can explore, you know, some of the ideas exactly the way um, I'm kind of hearing them and just see mm-hmm. where it goes, you know, and, and explore the, the benefits and the, you know, deficits of that, mm-hmm. you know. Like there's some times where even in my other projects, I'm like, oh, this is sounding really cool. Yeah, that's exactly how I want the drum. This and that. I'm like, man, Gabe would play that melody way better than I'm playing it right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's cool, though, that you get to um, I think it's important to have other outlets, mm. you know, after after a point, especially because, you know, we, we have different needs. We have different um, visions and it helps you it helps all the projects kind of have a freshness to it Mm -hmm. which in any relationship in any way you have to have you know you have to have ways of kind of recalibrating keeping things interesting you know yeah so um yeah that's kind of like what we do here we all just do like our own side things we do side gigs um and yeah it's uh it's it's awesome it's it gives you a much fuller more richer musical life yeah, no, I love that. And you use the word relationship to describe it. And that's a great word to use because even in relationships just in general, and we can talk about like romantic relationships, it's important to have a sense of self as well in those. So the fact that you all are also working on personal projects is very reflective of what a healthy relationship looks like. So that makes a lot of sense. Because in yeah. an everyday normal relationship, of course, it's really important to make sure that you're still at your core and individual and have a great sense of self. So, of, of course. course, within Consider the Source, you also have these independent projects that you work on. That's so cool. That's Yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. that. And relationship is like the perfect word to use there. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is like that. And, you know, I'm, I, all parties have to be sensitive to it. Uh-huh. You know, like if you're going to be in, you know, unless you're unless you're like a hired gun for a specific thing and they're like, here's the baseline, play that baseline. Here's the drum part, play that drum part. You know, mm. if I want you to do your own thing, I'll let you know, do your own thing. You know, unless it's that kind of situation, that's different. That's a different kind of transaction. That's not so much a relationship. Yeah. But if you're in a project where it's everyone's band, then, you know, I think that's the way to... Uh, that's that's the way you have to operate. Mm, yeah, in terms in of longe- long longevity as well, and maintaining the health of yourselves and the band. I think that's a very great point. I think that's yeah. the way that it kind of needs to be. So we're at the last question already. Now this question, 
a, we get a, I get a lot of different responses to it. It is a bit of a weird question, but I do like to tie to the title of the podcast. So <laughs> if you were to choose a song that was essentially your soundtrack to success, what song would it be? So a song that essentially represents you or the success that you've had in your career so far, because it's not finished. You have mm-hmm. successes yet to experience. What song, it could be a Consider the Source song, it could be a song from childhood, it could be a song of your own. I know this is a tough ass to pick one. Yeah, it's it's tough, especially because most of the music that I like is instrumental. Um, <laughs> yeah, but there's so emotion one, in that. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. of course. Um, well, uh, you know what I'd have to say is, you know... Um, since tapping is such a huge part of what I do now as a bass Mm. player, you know, um, once I made that shift, it it became like, I became pretty obsessed with it. One of the things, one of the songs that really put me over to the edge to want to tap the way that I do, Mm. it was Brad Meldow's version of Paranoid Android. Okay. And uh, by Radiohead. Yeah. So Brad Meldow's an incredible jazz pianist and he did a cover of, yeah, like maybe Radiohead's most famous song. Mm-hmm. And it was, ju- I mean, I love that song to death, just the original version of it, a beautiful composition. But what Brad does with the song is just like, like the pinnacle of, of like musical achievement, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and it's and between it just emotionally being such a beautiful song and his way of uh, exploring it just being so spot on and so explorative and... um. Uh, yeah, just just incredibly powerful. That song kind of put me over the edge, and I've listened to it a thousand times, and it's mm-hmm. always in my head, and um, really kind of spurred me along. So, be- because of not only how much I love it, but because of um, how meaningful it was to me, and how inspired mm. I was after I first heard it to do something else with the instrument, and how that changed the whole, literally, the trajectory of my life. Yeah, literally. You know? Yeah, the, the two things being that's you know that song and the bass that I have having a high C string and it just being mm-hmm. such a great <clears throat> a great instrument uh, by Federa, who's just the best luthiers in the world in my opinion. Um, th- both of those things turned me into a different player. Yeah, I became a completely different bass player. A complete, I, I feel like I became more of a composer than than a than um than than only a bass player at that yeah. point. No, so, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there you go. That's that would be the song I would choose. Thank and I probably you. choose that every day of the week. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking oh, maybe he'll have a different one tomorrow. But no, that was a great answer. I love that. And the whole composer changed from to composer from bass player is a really good way of saying it because it does make a lot of sense. And that's kind of how your journey's been. I do also have to say I love the t-shirt that you're wearing. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was thanks. meaning to say it for such a long time. For people who are listening, it says support your local pizza dealer. Um, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So this shirt was uh, my drummer, Jeff, in Consider the Source. He makes these shirts. He makes different pizza-related shirts because he's obsessed oh, nice. with pizza. Okay. And um, <clears throat> it's really funny. Yeah, he, he, he'll do this thing where... If he if he like goes if we go to a city and he eats a slice of pizza that's not good, it's uh-huh. almost as if he didn't eat it. He'll just go out and find a better one, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> or, funny. Or, or or just a better meal. And he's like, oh, no, 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 I have to get a redemption slice. Yeah, he's not yeah, he's, letting he's, it ruin his day. That's why he's not. No, no. exactly. But <clears throat> yeah, so he makes this shirt. So I, I I wear it a lot. I love it. It's hysterical. I've it's had it for really like cool. five years now. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, it, you, makes me laugh it looks every time brand new. It. That's cool. It actually looks brand new for if you haven't it for oh, five years. Actually, you know what? You know what? I might have lied to you. This might be my new one. He gave me one oh, last week. That's <laughs> a new one. Say. And I do have... Yeah, he was like, did you ask for a new one? I was like, no, but I'll take it. That's, <laughs> I'll totally take a new one. Yeah. All the peach asserts, I'll have all of them. Yeah, I, I, one of each. Yeah. Oh, thank you, John, for taking the time to speak to me. It's been really nice. Yeah, um, thanks so much for having me. It's great talking to you. No problem. I was going to say welcome anytime. You you genuinely are welcome anytime. But I don't know what we'd speak about in the second episode. Who knows? Um, yeah, some new questions. 
Homeowners, if you're looking for the best in home security and smart home technology at a price you can actually afford, we have great news. Now you can get Vivint's award-winning home security systems starting at about a dollar a day. U.S. News & World Report has recognized Vivint as the best professionally installed home security system of 2022. And right now, you can get Vivint's home security technology for about a dollar a day. Plus, get free professional installation from a licensed technician. Protect your home and loved ones for as low as a dollar a day. Call right now for your free home security consultation. 800-587-4281. 800-587-4281. 800-587-4281. That's 800-587-4281. Packages start at $29.99 a month with signed agreement. Restrictions apply. Speak to a representative for complete offer details. See Vivint.com for license details. Terms and conditions apply. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-557-7921. 800-557-7921. 800 That's 800-557-7921. If you served in the Marine Corps, by now you know about the contaminated water problem at Camp Lejeune. If you were stationed or worked at Camp Lejeune from 1953 to 1987, you probably have a lot of questions. We have some answers. You could be entitled to compensation. Billions of dollars are being allocated to pay for damages to anyone stationed at Camp Lejeune during that time. Unfortunately, it appears that officials may have known the contaminated water problem existed and did little to protect their men. The Semper Fi Code was not honored. If you or someone in your family has developed a serious illness, including various forms of cancer, call this Camp Lejeune legal support line right now. You can't turn back the clock and change what happened, but you can certainly call right now and learn your rights as a Marine. Here's the number. 800-485-5801. 800-485-5801. 800-485-5801. 800-485-5801. That's 800-485-5801.